The story that this podcast is going to start with today is not a happy story, my friends. It starts with a scorpion on my shoulder that's crawling its way toward my face. That's how I begin this adventure. So she asked me if it was a logo on my jacket or if it was an actual scorpion. And uh, I'm looking at the scorpion right now. And that's where we're going to start today's podcast episode. Welcome to another episode of Everyday Badassery. I'm your host, Christine Lozada. This is a traveling podcast meant to inspire you to be just 1% more badass today than you were yesterday. Our big badass moments in life are made up of all our little itty bitty ones. And there's a lot of itty bitty ones that I'm going to share with you in today's podcast. But This story is coming from what I just traveled back with. I just spent five days in the California desert in an area called uh, Borrego Springs and Glamis. It's where the famous sand dunes are located. And I'm out here for Rebel Rally. And I'm going to share with you today some some wild stories that came out of the weekend and there's really there's there's I was thinking like what's the theme like what's the theme of this podcast and it's really around like staying calm during like really insane circumstances because (laughs) we all need to keep calm so we can adventure on and there were a lot of moments that happened over my rebel rally training in which I could have just pumped the brakes and jumped ship, or I guess jumped off-road vehicle, and gotten out of there and just quit, thrown in the towel. There were a lot of moments where it was like, oh, yo, I'm in way over my head, literally about to be over my head, potentially rolling a vehicle. And so let's talk about some of these stories, starting with that scorpion. And that scorpion started at minute zero. Uh, But first, actually, let's talk about what the heck you're like, Rebel Rally? What the heck is Rebel Rally? Rebel Rally is, it's not a race. I guess it's technically what it's called, a rally. It's a drive that's 1,600 miles. It happens over eight days through the desert. To this year's rally goes from Northern California in the Tahoe area through the desert all the way down to the Southern California desert area in this area that I'm training at, the Borrego Glamis area. And over these 1600 miles, this is the key part. There's no phones and no GPS. These are teams of two and specifically women. It's called rebel, like, you know, the f- it's a female play on the word rebellion, right? So rebel rally is teams of two. There's around 55 teams. In other words, like 100-ish women participating in this. And you drive 1,600 miles, no phone, no GPS, in an off-road vehicle through the desert. And we will we will talk about <laughs> mapping and how that works because you're like, well, how do you figure out how to navigate, right? And that's a big part of what my training was this weekend. And so I'm here in the desert for a four day training, and I came a day early uh, to prepare and get my all my stuff together because we had to meet up in uh, in the desert at these random coordinates, and we had to meet there exactly 7:45 a.m. And so we get there at 7.45 in the morning. I jump out of the car. I'm like, ooh, it's kind of cold. So I go grab my jacket and I put my jacket on. And I step out and I'm like really excited. Like, I'm excited to meet these other badass women. I mean, who participates in something like this, right? I'm probably going to meet some really cool, like, I don't know, interesting people. And so I'm so excited to come out and like give high fives and shake hands and see who's who. And we're all standing together in a circle for the ones who've arrived so far. And one of the ladies looks at me and she goes, hey, I don't know if that's a logo on your jacket, because if it's not, there's a scorpion on you. And I look down and I think, oh, this is bad. And I look at her and I say, hmm, that's a scorpion. And I actually didn't know what to do in this moment. It was like kind of being calm. It was kind of like moving, but it was like on my shoulder. And so I took a deep breath and I just, I like flicked it as hard as I could. 
I actually flicked it really hard. And I was immediately impressed that this thing like had a death grip on my jacket. It was not getting off. And all I could think of was shit. Okay, stay calm. Like, stay calm. As soon as you start freaking out, you know, like that's when you like piss off the bee and like it stings you, except like this is a scorpion and I can't, I, we haven't even started the training yet. Like, I can't have this thing sting me right off the bat. I've got way too many adventures ahead of me. So keep calm so that I can adventure on. And I take a deep breath and I look at it and I flick it again as hard as I can. And now, not only is it still death gripping my jacket, it's still there. Now it's starting to get agitated and it's starting to crawl toward my face. And I was like, okay, now I'm like, okay, this is not working. I'm either going to truly flick it three times lucky, right? Or I'm going to take off my jacket as quickly and safely as possible while keeping an eye on it. So it doesn't like jump on my, I don't know, do our scorpions jump? So it doesn't jump on my face or something. And so I, I took a deep breath and like, this isn't like five seconds that have gone by, like, this is around like 15 seconds, which given there's a scorpion on my shoulder and everyone's staring at me, like it's a pretty good amount of time. And I take a deep breath and I finally, I just flick it as hard as I can and it finally jumps to the ground. Which by the way, if you are watching today's podcast episode, you will see the scenes of this scorpion. I took a video of it after I flicked it off. And uh, you'll see a bunch of just scenes from the weekend, which will also be in edited vlog-like videos if you want to see what my day-by-day -day events were like, because it was actually really fascinating. And so I finally flick it off, and I'm just like, oh, like the weight is off my, well, the weight and the scorpion are off my shoulder. And what was interesting were like all the women were just like, oh, wow, like these are badass women. No one was freaking out. No one was screaming. No one was like running at me with a bat trying to kill the thing, right? They let me handle my, literally my shit. They let me handle my shit. And as soon as I got it off me, the woman who had thought it was a logo, who had pointed it out on my shoulder, she just goes, wow, I am so impressed with how calmly you, you executed that. And I was like, well, yes, because think about the opposite. If, like I started freaking out, like this situation could have gone real south real fast. And, and the other thing is like, if I freaked out, it would put me in that mindset for the rest of the weekend. And I knew that I would have some serious things coming my way that I would have to battle and get through. And I needed to be strong from minute one all the way through. And so this story start started with that scorpion. <sighs> you ready for the next one? This one was really unexpected. Not as unexpected. Well, no, it was unexpected. So this training is divided in two ways. It's divided with two days of driving, off-road driving, things like how to slide down the sand dunes in your off-road vehicle, how to drive rainbows, which is imagine going up the side of a dune, like kind of going toward the top, maybe realizing you can't clear the other side because maybe it's a razorback and you'll just literally tumble and drop off the other side and come back down. Things like if you get stuck in the sand, like how do you get out? And like learning how to um, correctly get out of the sand and potentially dig yourself out using, just imagine something that looks like big sleds. They're called max tracks and they help you and you wedge them underneath the tires after you've done a ton of digging in the 100 degree plus heat uh, to help you get out, uh, like literally crawl yourself out of the sand in your vehicle. And so we're about to do the driving portion for two days. And then the next two days is the navigation. And like I mentioned, every Rebel Rally team is two people. And so my partner and I had agreed that she would be the driver because she has off-road vehicle experience. She's been off-roading a bunch of times. She's actually done this rally a couple times. Like she's experienced. Um, she's also getting, uh, she has off-road vehicles, but she's going to get be getting a new Tacoma truck for this event, blah, blah, blah. And I was going to be the navigator, which we'll talk more about what navigation means. And so we're on day one, she's driving everything's going great. We're learning a bunch of stuff about driving in sand and like we're getting used to the feeling and 
here's something I did not know. If you want to safely drive in sand, and I'm talking sand dune sand, not packed beach beautiful sand, sand dune sand, you actually air down your tires significantly, literally by more than half. In other words, our tires are normally at a pressure of 55 PSI. We brought them down all the way to 17 PSI. If you don't know what that means, basically it looks like you almost have a flat tire and it's not actually safe to drive that vehicle on a regular road after you've aired it down that much. And so it makes it safe on sand because having more surface area helps you to more easily drive over the sand. But um, if you don't air it down, then <laughs> it's difficult. You're like sinking in the sand if your air is, if your tires have too much pressure. And so she's doing a great job. She's driving, and all of a sudden, all of a sudden, and we each car has radios, radios in them. And so we get a call over the radio, and it says, "All right, switch drivers." And I was like, "Wait, wait, wait, wait. no, no, no!" Like I pick up the radio, and I'm like. No, you know, I'm I'm navigator, so we're gonna keep the same driver. And they're like, nope, everybody drives, switch spots. And we were like, you can see all the other women like cur like running to switch spots because we gotta get back to training. We got things we gotta do. We're in the middle of the hot desert. And and I'm having this moment where one, uh, we actually so the car we're using is a Land Rover. And it's, it's actually a borrowed car. It's her mother-in-law's car, who her mother-in-law is a total badass, participates in the Rebel Rally every single year, um, has done it over eight times or however many times, um, maybe close to a dozen. I think it's been around for like 10 years. So she's participated in every one. We're borrowing her car. So I'm about to jump behind the wheel of a car that's not only not mine, but not my partner's. The second thing, I, I've driven off road with like, you know, ATVs with like quads, with like dune buggies. We are driving a regular vehicle here. I've never driven anything like a regular vehicle in the dunes, in sand. And so, okay, strike two. I don't know how to do this. And then, you know, three, like we're in an environment that's, you know, the, these aren't the baby dunes. Like, we are in the dunes. And like, we are about to slide down some crazy stuff and drive in some crazy areas where I look at it and I'm like, you can't drive down that. And then you watch them drive down that and you're like, okay, I'm next. And so I get behind the wheel all of a sudden, very unexpectedly. And I'm having this oh shit moment. And again, like, it goes back to like, Keep calm so you can adventure on. Otherwise, you will potentially be in a very treacherous situation because rolling, rolling your car in the dunes is, is not hard. It's not hard. It's not hard to get stuck and it's not hard to roll your vehicle. Uh, there's a lot of things that can go wrong here. And I could, like, right? I could be like, no, I'm not ready. Uh, and I'm like, nah. I'm gonna give this my best shot because that's the best we can do. I've had the last, I don't know, 30 minutes or whatever to watch my partner do it, doing the thing, right? Like I've been observing and I'm like, okay, like I, I can do this, right? And so we, we switch spots and now I'm behind the wheel and we're going through all these different exercises. And one of the things is, you know, like immediately, and I notice it immediately, anytime I lose confidence or I doubt myself or something like that, I, I start to become bad in my driving. And when I say bad, I mean things like I'll start going up the dunes, but then I second guess myself and I lose confidence about how much I should be hitting the gas because you are literally pedal to the metal to get over the top of the dune. But the crazy thing is once you get over the top of the dune, is it safe on the other side? You can't see anything. All you can see is the top of the dune and blue sky. You won't see the other side until you've zoomed over the top. And one of the crazy things about driving off-road and in the dunes is you use two-foot pedaling, two-foot driving, what the heck they call it, two feet on the pedals. In other words, you, you don't go from you're just your right foot on the gas and your and your right foot then switching over to the brake. You drive with your right foot wedged against the side of the car, like, like signaling to the gas and like 
like kind of coaxing the gas, like you are easing into the gas and you're using your left foot to simultaneously brake when you need to. Because I, I mean, I use this a lot when I ride motorcycles and mopeds because I have my motorcycle license. It helps to give you way more control when you are both gassing and braking at the same time. Learning to do this on the fly in a vehicle, I've never done before. And so now I'm doing this action and like going over these dunes. I'm trying not to freak out, but I'm noticing anytime I like start to lose confidence or I, I'm not being as calm as possible, I'll get stuck in the dunes. And then luckily I always had to just reverse out. Um, but there was a moment in which, you know, I thought I was confident in the four wheel drive setting I was in. I thought I was in the right gear. I was in second gear and we're doing something called a rainbow, which is, you know, going up to the side of the dune and making like a rainbow across the dune and then coming back down and driving out of there. And, um, my partner thought that I was in the wrong gear and too soon after I had started going, she changed my gears. And in that moment, I lost all confidence because I had a plan for second gear. I didn't have a plan for third gear. And so instead of just being like, keep calm, you know, adventure on, adjust and flex to this new gear, I lost confidence. And it like, basically, you know, the, the momentum I had going to get up the dune was all gone because the gears were switched and now I didn't have the momentum to get up. And and then I was like, you know, you know, when you come up on a, oh, the light's yellow and you're like, I can make it. I can't make it. I can't make it. I can't make it. And you're like, gas, brake, gas, brake. And then you're like, you either slam on the gas or you slam on the brake. You can't do that in the sand, in the dunes. And so I gassed and then I braked. And what happened was we were halfway up the dune, halfway up the rainbow with the car at an angle, and now it was uh, at a complete stop slash stuck, but we were in a position, now the sand is moving around us, right? And so the vehicle's shifting, and it's in perfect roll position. In other words, like, don't even open that door. Like, don't don't get out. Like, don't, don't even move. Like, don't even reach for anything. Like, is this thing going to roll over and down the dune into the hole in the center of the dune? And so I was having this freak out moment. Um, and I was like, okay, as soon as, like, as soon as it happened, I, like, made sure that the brakes were completely on. And I was like, I'm not an expert in this situation. And so I said, you know, like, hand me the radio um, because I wanted someone else who was watching us from afar, the instructor, to instruct me on how to get out of the situation. Like I didn't want to try to like fix things or move things or like flip it in reverse real fast or like do a quick change. Like this was not the time for that. The time was to stay calm, ask for help, and then as confident as po confidently as possible, maneuver my way out of there, <sighs> which we did. <sighs> okay, so that's driving. Let's talk about feeling lost in the desert, maybe lost in life and lost in the desert, because navigating is gnarly. And like as you're hearing these stories, like I want you to be thinking about like your own moments in life, in which you were confident in yourself, you know, and you were able to get through things you didn't think you could get through, but you did because you were just calm and confident. You believed in yourself. You said, yes. You know, I didn't always think like, oh, I'm going to crush this. I'm going to be amazing. But I had Christine, the cheerleader in my head. I was on my own side. As soon as Christine, the non-cheerleader, was like, yo, <laughs> you effed, girlfriend. Like, yeah, you don't got this. As soon as that voice was there, I didn't got this. I didn't do well. But as long as, like, I was keeping that voice in my head, like, really encouraging myself, telling me yes, perception becomes reality. When we tell ourselves, like, yeah, like, we can do this. You know, like, no, I've never driven a vehicle like this in the sand and the dunes, but I've driven other vehicles, dune buggies, ATVs. Yeah, it's different, but I have experience here. So let's take that little, itty bitty, 
certain amount of confidence I have. Let's carry that shit forward. And think about, you know, which voice are you using, not just in difficult situations, but every day. You know, I did not want to do this podcast episode. You can hear it in my voice. I'm still a little bit congested because I was literally inhaling sand the entire weekend. I have a coat of the desert that I have taken back to Florida with me, and it is coating not just my throat, but my nostrils, my sinuses, my lungs, and just about everything else. Like, I I am sandy inside. You can call me Sandy Christine for the next little while while I cough this stuff out. Um, but I didn't feel like it, but I was like, no, like you got this. You genuinely care, Christine, about sharing this message with others because it might lift them up and it might make them think differently about both their small moments, again, like those 1% moments in life and their big moments, right? And so I was like, yeah, I can do this. Like, you know, throw on the camera, let's talk from the heart. Because you got this. I got this and you got this. So consider that in your everyday life and in your big, badass, scary moments. Which voice is in your head and what are you telling yourself? You need that cheerleader game on all the time. All right, let's talk about feeling lost AF. Because, you know, I never really was lost AF. Like, And these were moments where I really should have given myself more credit. It's tough because like, I really excelled in school and I was not feeling like I was excelling in this school. And so imagine this, we're in a classroom-like setting, i.e. <laughs> a, a shade tent with some tables set up in the middle of the desert. It's hot, really hot. And we're learning how to navigate. And a lot of people are like, oh, when you say navigate, do you mean like, you know, you're sitting passenger to the driver and being like, careful, there's a rock there. Or like, careful, there's a tree there. Like, oh, take a left here. Yes to the take a left here part, or rather it would be something like, you know, 280 degrees, you know, go in this direction with my compass, blah, blah. Um, it's not like that. And so this is how the Rebel Rally works. You're given coordinates, coordinates of where you are at camp at the beginning point, And then you're given like 15, 20, sometimes even more, 25, 30 checkpoints in a day, 10 hours of driving in a day on average for most people. And you're driving again, right? 1600 miles in total. You're driving all day long trying to hit these checkpoints. And each checkpoint is associated with an instruction. It might either be another set of um, coordinates or it might say something like 139 degrees from checkpoint one and you know the coordinates from checkpoint one. And so imagine getting a topographic map, which is if you're like, what the heck is that? Imagine a map of the desert that's like you can see the hills and you can see like some basic things, but you need a magnifying glass. And I'm not joking. A lot of the women had magnifying glasses. I'm definitely buying a magnifying glass for this to read this map. And you need to use um, a compass and you need to use a plotter, a map plotter and a ruler. And the ruler is helping you to measure um, the degrees and blah, 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 to be able to figure out where on the map those coordinates are. And imagine making a little itty bitty dot with the tip of a pen. Like go make a little dot with the tip of a pen. That tip of the pen, depending on what kind of pen it is, could on this scale of a map be as much as a hundred meters like in radius. In other words, to hit these checkpoints, we need to be within 25 meters of the checkpoint for complete accuracy. Um, and so putting that in perspective, like the amount of detail that needs to go into how you navigate and plot your points needs to be so exact because otherwise, instead of being within a 25 meter range of your checkpoint, if your dot was too big, you'll be within 100, sometimes one of my dots, 300 meters. So if you're wondering how much is 300 meters, let's just, let's just say is far. So I'm learning how to navigate. And another thing that's just kind of a blow to my confidence is even though we're at training, 
there's a lot of return rebels. There's a lot of women who've done this before who are coming back because the skill of learning to navigate is not an easy one. And even though the skill is amazing to have for everyday like just knowledge of the world, it's not something you do every single day. And so needing a refresher on how to do this um, in preparation for Rebel Rally is really important. And so I'm amongst people who like already have a leg up on how to do this. And so it's, it's, it's not building my confidence that everyone's like diligently plotting their coordinates. And, you know, uh, when I, when I'm like, Hey, you know, Hey, Serena, do you mind if I just check my checkpoint one against yours? Um, and I look at mine and I look at hers and mine is in the mountains and hers is near like the wash near the river. I'm like, ah, oh, crap. <laughs> I did something wrong. Um, and I corrected my mistake. I like, I, I, knew, I figured out what it was. Um, but the thing is your checkpoints build on each other, right? Like if your checkpoint two is 139 degrees from checkpoint one, blah, 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 right? Like you can't get checkpoint two wrong. Um, but one thing, I will say this, one thing that, so you're not like following a rabbit, tra a rabbit trail that's completely incorrect. One thing they do with the rally and the way it's designed is while you do have no phone and no GPS, you are given like this device and it looks like a radio but what happens is when you push this device it's like uh it's connecting to the satellites for just a minute and it's telling the race officials that you think you're at a checkpoint you can only push it once when you're when you think you're at that checkpoint and this is how they're scoring you so they can know how accurate you actually are and so once you like you know send this beacon message that like y'all i think i'm at the checkpoint then it will read you back your exact coordinates of where you currently are. And so that's really important because it will help you understand like, well, how right or wrong you are. And if you're right, great, then your checkpoint too, because you've woken up at 5 a.m. Uh, on race day or rally day, and you've plotted out all your points for the day, your next checkpoint that's been plotted will likely be a good course of action on how to get there. Uh, but if it's wrong, then you gotta go back to the drawing board, figure out where you are, right? You're gonna use the topographic map, you're gonna use your plotter, you're gonna figure out where you are on the map, and then come up with a new, uh, way of getting to your next checkpoint. So if you're thinking like, oh yeah, you just find point A and point B on the map and then you just drive there, right? Like don't forget that this entire rally is off road. And so we are driving right through different washes, we're driving through the dunes, we're driving through all kinds of things. And so one of the ways I'm figuring out how to get from point A to point B, one, I'm trying to figure out how to safely get there, right? We can't just drive directly through a mountain, for example. Um, and the other thing is I'm using the ruler, which has kilometers on there, and I'm trying to make little tick marks along the quote unquote road I've created or way I've created to try to understand like how much distance is between here, point A and point B, for example, so that as I'm watching the odometer, and there's gonna be a large odometer in the car that both of us can look at, I'm able to track like, okay, cool. Like we are, we should be at this point we should be now, okay, now we've hit this point. And I'm like looking at the map at other things, right? Ah, okay, this, you know, this part of the mountain should look like that, or this part of the mountain is closest to where we're at at this point. And so I'm like ch checking things to make sure we're actually hitting those, those different areas. And <laughs> it doesn't work, right? It doesn't work if, you know, that's it's, it's still like kilometers is still going from point A to point B. Like we are driving around the rocks to avoid things. And so the odometer is racking up way more mileage than, than what you've accounted for. And so it's just a data point and it's not something that's exact. So I think that gives you kind of a, a taste of what navigating is like. Okay, let's fast forward to my oh crap moments. So we are at a checkpoint and we are trying to figure out like where we should hit that beacon to tell to tell us if we're at the checkpoint or not. And so we're kind of like, 
you know, tr- we're triangulating. Like I'm trying to figure out, okay, based off of, you know, we're actually near a railroad. So the railroad bends here. And, you know, if I take a heading of, you know, 156 degrees, then, you know, if we walk this distance for exactly 50 meters, we should get there. And I'm just having this moment where I'm like, and this was this was during training. So there's other women that were there who were trying to also figure it out. And everyone just like seemed like they had all their stuff together. And I was the only one that was like, oh, is it 156 degrees or is it 158? Because those two degrees, that two degree difference will take you somewhere else. Um, and so I was having this moment where I was just like, oh, what if I got it wrong? Like, and all the things. And again, it's training. So it doesn't matter if I get it wrong. But for the real deal, if you get that wrong, that's additional many hours of driving and potentially taking yourself to somewhere that's not safe to drive or something like that. Like during training, we had a certain area where there was a silt bed. If you accidentally ended up in the silt bed, it was 100% guaranteed you were digging yourself literally physically digging yourself with the shovels and the max tracks out of that silt bed. So there's no room for error to accidentally take the wrong road and have your coordinates wrong and have your mapping wrong. And I was just having this moment where I'm just like, oh my gosh, you know, like, I don't think I got this. And, you know, the non-cheerleader Christine was in my head. And the other thing is like, we're outside. It's hot. Like, I just wanted to be like, I can't figure this out. Everyone knows how to do this. Like, F this, I'm out of here. Like, I can barely read this compass correctly. I'm hard to put the red arrow in the matching arrow. It's supposed to line up with the red in the shed that everyone says. I'm like, well, I don't know. I feel like I'm red in the toilet right now. Like, that's how it felt. And so we're out there and I'm feeling frustrated. And I was like, no, the best thing that I can do now And at any point in my life, this morning when I was totally sucking in my pickleball game, uh, this afternoon when I was cooking a steak and it it didn't look like it was going very well. And actually, it looked like it was going well, (laughs) which is not how I wanted it, right? Like these are the moments where it's like the best that you can do is your best and you just have to take it from there and it's good enough like go with it just go with it if you don't keep calm if you don't just give it your best and then go with it the adventure stops it just stops and we got to keep going and like the only the only way to proceed is forward and so i gave it my best and on checkpoint 1 i was i was the 300 meters off i was way off i was a couple degrees off i was um i was not in range and so i would got i would have gotten 0 points for that in the actual rally for my very first time trying this out yo that was pretty good the woman that's done it twice before uh a different team who who actually did it last year is a oh an awesome team a mother and her daughter um they were close within about like 50 to 60 meters and so like yo, yo that's not that bad like pat yourself on the shoulder and pick it up and go do the next one. Keep calm, adventure on, believe in yourself, do the thing. All right, the last thing that was like, made it all difficult. It was made it so difficult was the amount of discomfort I was feeling this entire time, not because I was just out of my element, but because I was in the elements. One of the days clocked in at a heat index of 112. Like it was hot out there. It's hot, there's no ocean around, and I am a water baby. Like there is no water around us. And it was just so hot. And so it was interesting was not only mentally, like I had to take care of myself to get through this, but physically I needed to be taking so much care. And so the amount of water that I was drinking. And it's actually not safe to drink just water. I was handing out liquid IV like it was nobody's business. Like I was drinking tons of liquid IV. If you don't know what it is, uh, it hydrates you twice as fast as water and has three times more electrolytes than other sports drinks. And it's a fantastic way to get hydrated super fast. It's a, you know, mix of salt and sugar and electrolytes, et cetera. So anyway, that really helped me to stay on point. And, but the other thing was like, it was time. (laughs) It was a no shame moment. It was a no shame moment because with the amount that you're drinking, like literally chugging water all day long, I had a belly 
I had a belly on this trip because I was so bloated from all the water, but I literally needed to be drinking this amount of water. And I needed to go pee like every, like, I don't know, like 25 to 30 minutes. And when you're out there from, we would start our days at 6 a.m. and we'd finish around 7 or 8 p.m. before we'd go to bed at 9 p.m. Um, you know, we're in the desert, you know, like, oh, there's no, like, oh, can we just drive to the restroom? You know, it's, it's, let me go squat behind the car. Can everyone just not look for a minute while I just, you know, squat right here and go pee? And that's what it was all day long. Just, you know, constantly peeing. I, this will not go in this podcast video if you are watching it, but I was taking a selfie at one point, not realizing that, oh, there's someone, uh, you know, pants down, go and pee right behind me. <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> Deleted that one. Uh, so it was just, it was really uncomfortable. And, you know, my partner included, there were a couple women that suffered from the heat in a way that they couldn't fully participate in the entire um, training and had a medic with them and ha had to do all kinds of things. And so we were taking power showers, meaning <laughs> getting hosed off. Um, keeping our clothes wet, like anything that we could do. Oh, here's something that I'm really upset about. I left my eyeglasses in my tent and they're in, they were in the box, you know, or in the eyeglass case and everything. My eyeglasses melted. They melted in the tent. And it came to a point where like the, the film over the lenses got so hot just from the heat in general, from the desert, that I actually had to go today and bring the frames in to get re to get the lenses redone because I can't see out of them anymore. Like they're totally warped. I'm so upset about it. And I'm like, oh man, I just got those. All right, here's another 250 bucks for the lenses anyway. And the other thing is like, you know, we're not out there just relaxing and drinking champagne in the heat. Like we're digging the car out. We are in stressful situations where our internal heat is really high in addition to it being hot outside. I'm sweating balls because I'm nervous about everything, but I'm trying to keep my confidence up. Um, and it's just, it's hot, it's hot. And so these were my adventures from the scorpion to driving off-road for the first time to learning to navigate and feeling lost AF to just feeling so uncomfortable and hot and shameless about peeing in public. Like, man, there were a lot of drones up that were like, we had professional media out there capturing this. And I'm just like, is there a drone up? Like, let me just pee right here really quick. Like that's how, and these were all perfect excuses perfect excuses to throw in the towel and say no and I'm giving up but instead I chose right I chose to keep calm so that I could adventure on I chose as many times as I could to keep that positive voice going to cheerlead myself you want to be on your own team as soon as you start beating yourself up you can't get to that next adventure because you're held back at the current one or you've quit and you're not moving on to the next one I'm Christine Lozada. If this message resonated with you today, hit me up in some way. Tons of more show notes, ways to connect with me in the description below. I'm at Christine Lozada everywhere. There's a full blog post that goes along with this. Yo, go forth, be badass. I'll see you in the next adventure. Oh, and check out the entire vlog series that goes along with this. All right, ciao.